Welcome to your review for exam one. The first exam, the most friendly of the exams. The one you're going to look back on and say, remember the first exam, the times we had. So, What's this going to be like? What can you expect? Well, to begin with, uh, my first advice for you is, is just to sort of wrap your mind around the logistics here. You will see 50, multiple choice questions. You will have pretty much a day to finish this. It will be on Blackboard. They will open the day of the exam, which is listed on your syllabus, I believe a week from now. And once you start, you'll have several hours to complete the exam. For your lab exam, there will be 50 identification questions. You'll be labeling diagrams, photos, and the like. So remember that your lecture exam is 70% of your grade. The lab exam is 30%. So let's talk about material now. So thus far, we had uh, a few major topics and some minor ones. And one of the things that I would encourage you to pay attention to here is the big picture. I am not a fan of minutia. While I am an absolute fountain of trivial information, I'm not going to be testing you over trivial information because in practice, that's not what's important. Had this conversation with the nursing school. They'd much rather you know the pathway of blood through the heart than understanding how slow calcium channels and uh, fast sodium channels work in cardiac muscle cells. The big picture is important. Now, the details that we've discussed do add up to that big picture. So I'm not saying ignore the details. I am saying, however, that I don't expect you to memorize minutia and facts. It's not trivial pursuit. I expect you to be able to pull all of the information together into one big idea. So don't lose the forest for the trees as you study for this. And make more, no mistake, you do need to study for this. Just because the exam is on Blackboard does not mean that you're going to be able to go online and find the answers as we go. I guarantee you the questions aren't on Quizlet. Yes, I know what Quizlet is. I also know what Reddit is. I can use a computer.
So don't lose sight of the big picture and make sure that you understand this material. With that, let's continue. All right, so what can you expect? Well, I'm not overly concerned with the history of anatomy. While it is fun, it is also trivial knowledge. You don't really need to know that Orophilus was accused of vivisecting prisoners or that Vesalius was the first real anatomist who actually did science and negated ideas from Galen. This is not relevant. It's not going to come up in clinical practice. So I'm not concerned about that. Things that I am concerned from that first lecture in terms of introduction are directional terms. You should look at those pairs of directional terms and more importantly, be able to use them appropriately. You should be able to say something like, the wrist is distal to the elbow. The skin is superficial to the muscle. The shoulder is proximal to the elbow. The head is superior to the neck. The heart is medial to the lungs. I'm not going to give you anatomical structures that you're not aware of. But generally you should be able to use those terms and relate them appropriately. You should also know those directional planes. The sagittal plane, the transverse plane, the frontal plane, and you should recognize what that looks like. You should recognize a transverse section. If I throw a, a transverse section of the brain on your exam, you should recognize that that horizontal cut is a transverse section. So make sure that you understand what those different directional planes mean as well. Other things from our first introduction and really something that's gonna come up quite often is that you understand how scientific thought works. This brings us to sort of a, a critical thinking idea. I don't expect you to verbatim remember the qualities of science. I'm not going to ask you to pick them out of a list. But given two ideas, with understanding what it means to be scientific or what it means to be a scientific idea, I would hope that you would be able to pick out a scientific concept versus a, for instance, a, a pseudoscientific concept. More and more, this idea becomes integral to our survival. As as we fight this global pandemic, more and more we see anti-scientific ideas coming up, especially about vaccinations. Lately, there have been a lot of quote unquote experts in the field who have spread narratives that have really confused the public in terms of their understanding of vaccination science. And 
And quite often, these people claiming to be experts who are or who are not are given a platform to debate people who are actually experts. And that further confuses the facts that we know. So just remember that scientific thought is based on testable, reliable, repeatable data. It's published scientific journals. Like I said, I don't expect you to remember each and every quality of science, but looking at that, you should be able to distinguish between a scientific idea and a pseudoscientific idea. Another big thing from that, that first day was the idea of homeostasis. This constant internal environment that we keep. What do I care that you know about homeostasis? You need to know that homeostasis is maintained via negative feedback. When the product of the system inhibits the system, just like the thermostat in your house. The heat comes on, hot air comes out, it turns off the thermostat. At least I assume that's the case. Right now I'm having a heater issue and I need to have my uh, furnace repaired and it's like 65 degrees in my house. Homeostasis maintained through negative feedback, constant internal environment. That is a big picture idea, and it's something that's going to come up repeatedly. Now, in terms of chemistry, there's not really a lot that I care for you to know. Basically, our chemistry lecture was a leveler, so that if you haven't seen chemistry in a while, or you have no idea about anything chemical that you can get on the same page as the rest of us. That you can look at these things and see the things that are relevant. You do need to know the four classes of organic chemicals, those being carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, and know roughly the function of each of these in our physiology. Carbohydrates are fuel, lipids have lots of structure, um, lots of function, cholesterol and hormones and energy storage. Proteins freaking do everything. Nucleic acids are genetic material. Along with that, you do need to know that carbohydrates are polar molecules which makes them hydrophilic, as are proteins and nucleic acids. Lipids are nonpolar and hydrophobic. That's important. Why? Because it comes up later when we talk about the cell membrane and how things cross over back and forth across the cell membrane through different types of transport. So I'm not going to ask you to balance equations or identify equations. The chemistry that we care about is the chemistry as it applies to your physiology. You need to know what an enzyme is. An enzyme is a protein, it's a biological catalyst. It increases the rate of a reaction. Let's talk a little bit about enzymes and enzyme pathways. All right. So I'm a big fan of questions where you need to apply 
information, like the idea that enzymes are biological catalysts, for instance, to how uh, your, your physiology works. So we have a molecule CH3, CH2OH. This is ethanol. If you're not familiar with ethanol, ethanol is produced by microorganisms as part of fermentation. Um, it's the alcohol that's in alcoholic beverages. Now you do produce a minute amount of ethanol in your own physiology daily, whether you drink or not. So what happens then is that uh, this molecule, it's a central nervous system depressant in higher amounts, it may uh, suppress your nervous system to the point where you forget to breathe and you die. That's not great. You don't want that. Even as a depressant, right, you, being drunk on a daily basis isn't optimal. No judgment. But your body's set up for this. So what we do is we take ethanol. And we have an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. Notice that ASE, that's how enzymes end. Alcohol dehydrogenase takes ethanol and turns it into something called acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is CH3CHO. See what we did there? We lost the water molecule. This is acetaldehyde. Now, acetaldehyde is really not your friend. It's not toxic, toxic, but it's not, you know, the greatest. So what happens is that This molecule is torn apart by another enzyme called acetaldehyde oh, I know you can't read that and I apologize writing on your computer screen is overrated dehydrogenase and it's going to turn that acetaldehyde into another molecule CH3 COOH it's called acidic acid Now, without this second enzyme, this molecule sticks around and, and you get a really bad hangover. Without this first enzyme, this molecule sticks around and you're super drunk. Actually, your ability to detoxify alcohol is based on the presence of this enzyme in the liver. The more of this your liver cells uh, produce, the more uh, higher tolerance you have, the more alcohol you're able to detoxify. Now, this is not talking about a tolerance for intoxication. This is talking about detoxifying the alcohol. And that's what we've done in this pathway of enzymes is we've detoxified the alcohol. I was taking a relatively toxic molecule here with ethanol 
and turned it into uh, basically a carbohydrate. Uh, it's a carbohydrate all the way through, don't get me wrong. But here, this acetic acid can enter uh, the cellular cycle and, and we can turn that directly into ATP. More on that in another semester. Let's... Take a different molecule. CH3OH. Now this is methanol. The thing with methanol is methanol looks a lot like ethanol. In fact, it's identical. It's clear colorless liquid, smells the same, tastes the same. It'll get you drunk. The difference is is that when we take our alcohol dehydrogenase, we don't get acetaldehyde here. Instead, we get formaldehyde. So what is formaldehyde? Well, it's the stuff you preserve dead things in. It's a preservant. It's also a neurotoxin. So here's what happens, and this is why you can't make your own hard liquor, right? You can distill, well, you can make your own wine, um, you make your own beer, but distilleries are a different thing altogether and not illegal. Um, you have to have permits and you have to run a distillery because when you distill alcohol, you need to get ethanol. If you screw it up, you can get methanol. You can't tell the difference. Sell that to someone and they ingest methanol and it's toxic. A methanol toxicity will kill you or if you're lucky it will just make you go blind and damage your brain this is an enzyme it speeds up this chemical reaction enzyme here it's a protein it's a biological catalyst enzymes All right. Most of what I care about with chemistry is chemistry is how it applies to cellular physiology. A lot of what I care about with the cell is based on the cell membrane. But before we talk about the cell membrane, let's talk about organelles and such. With all those organelles, I need you to know functions. I don't need you to know mechanisms. I don't care right now about oxidative phosphorylation and how mitochondria make ATP. I need you to know that mitochondria make ATP. I need you to know that ribosomes make proteins. Basic function of the organelles is what I care about you understanding now. Now, again, I need you to be able to apply this knowledge. If I tell you that there is a, a toxin that when ingested or inhaled disrupts the process of manufacturing proteins, you need to know that the organelle that is involved there will be the ribosomes. Actually, there is a toxin that does this. It's called a ricin. You've probably heard of ricin, especially if you watch Breaking Bad. Uh, ricin is extremely toxic and it stops protein synthesis. It prevents the cells from putting amino acids together in the proteins because it disrupts the ribosomes.
it's not a rapid way to die. It takes several days before symptoms appear because the cells can't make proteins, which means they can't do their jobs, which means they can't repair themselves, they can't replicate, they're damaged and they start dying off. With treatment, you have a pretty good chance of recovery. Without treatment, you're dead. If I tell you there's a toxin that disrupts ATP manufacture, do you know that's going to affect the mitochondria? If I tell you there's a disease where uh, fatty acid is mistakenly shipped to the wrong part of the cell, that's going to affect the Golgi apparatus because the Golgi apparatus is responsible for shipping things to where they need to go in the cell. It's the FedEx of the cell. So no basic structure of the organelles. Now, which ones are membrane bound and which ones aren't? It's much easier to name the ones that aren't. Ribosomes don't have a membrane. There you go. Elements of the cytoskeleton, basically know what those are. But basically in terms of internal physiology of the cell, I'm just looking at, at, at what those organelles do. Now, the plasma membrane is a different story. We spent quite a bit of time with the plasma membrane. And while I'm not overly concerned with you being able to talk about the phospholipid bilayer and uh, st uh, structure and the unique properties of the phospholipid, what I'm really concerned with is that you understand membrane transport and how things get in and out of the cell, that you understand the difference between simple diffusion facilitated diffusion osmosis. Now all three of these are passive transport, no ATP, high to low concentration. What can cross the membrane? This is a big, big thing. Things that are lipid, soluble across the membrane freely. What things are lipid soluble? Lipids. So if you have a question, hypothetically, that says, which of these can freely cross the membrane, pick the lipid. So in that case, you do need to know what lipids are. For instance, testosterone. Testosterone is a steroid hormone. Steroids are lipids. So testosterone freely crosses the cell membrane. Triglycerides. Triglycerides are lipids crossing the cell membrane. Estrogen, steroid hormone crossing the cell membrane. Cholesterol, a lipid crossing the cell membrane. You get the idea, recognize lipids, no, they freely cross the membrane. That's simple diffusion, passive transport. They don't need any help. For everyone else, for everything that is a polar molecule, you're going to have to have either active transport or facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion, we've got those, those channel proteins, carrier proteins that are gonna bring something in. Still passive transport, no ATP being used. And then we have osmosis. Now osmosis is really important as is the principle of tonicity. So you need to know the difference between hypotonic hypertonic and isotonic. Iso means same So an isotonic solution has the same number of particles inside the cell as outside the cell. Isotonic, no net movement. Put a cell in a hypotonic solution, water goes in. In a hypertonic solution, water goes out. 
the cell shrivels up. Think about putting salt on a snail. Salt on a snail, that's hypertonic. The water leaves the snail. Water follows stuff around. This is the big rule. This is the rule of osmosis and tonicity. Water follows around stuff. Water always moves to where there's more concentration of solute. So know what cells do in these different solutions. When you hang an IV bag on a patient, it's not water, it's saline. And it's because that saline is isotonic to the plasma so that you don't get net movement of water in or out of the bloodstream. We also have active transport. Know that active transport uses ATP of major importance to us. Primary active transport, which directly uses ATP. You need to know the sodium potassium pump. You need to know that this moves three sodium out two potassium in. Every cell in your body doing this all the time. Three sodium out, two potassium in. Three sodium out, two potassium in. It's a constant thing. It helps maintain that tonicity and it helps maintain the electrochemical balance of the cells. It also sets up a situation so that we can get secondary active transport. Secondary active transport uses the gradient from primary active transport. This would be like our sodium glucose symport. Where sodium and glucose are allowed to come back in the cell simultaneously as long as they come together, but we have to use the gradient, that sodium gradient, to move the glucose into the cell. Secondary active transport uses the gradient from primary active transport. And then our other types of active transport are vesicular transport. And you should just remember all those types of vesicular transport, they're all active transport. And we're talking like exocytosis and endocytosis and transcytosis. I'm not worried about receptor mediated endocytosis or that process. You need to know these are forms of active transport. You need to know that bringing something into the cell is endocytosis and pushing something out of the cell is exocytosis. If you go in one side and out the other, that's transcytosis. Another big picture thing here is this idea, DNA, RNA, protein. This is transcription. This is translation. This is a major thing. DNA, RNA, protein, transcription, translation. Transcription translation. Translation is at the ribosome. Translation is taking that messenger RNA code and turning it into a protein. I'm not worried about the phases of mitosis. You should know the result of mitosis is two identical cells. From one, you had one, and you've got two identical cells as a cell cloning, growth, repair, that sort of thing. But I'm not worried about the phases or what happens in each individual phase.
So big picture sell stuff. Don't get lost in the details. Histology. Histology would have been the last thing that just posted. Know your four primary tissue classes. Know your types of, man, this is getting worse. Connective tissue. And you will see some identification of both epithelial and connective tissue proper slides. So look at those slides and be able to identify the different types of epithelial tissue, connective tissue. Um, make sure you know the difference between simple and stratified epithelium, that you know the difference in the purpose of simple and stratified epithelium. Simple epithelium is a single layer of cells. It wants something to cross it. It's made for diffusion or filtration, something absorption. Stratified epithelium is for protection. those different types of connective tissue proper, be able to recognize those slides. You know the qualities of uh, epithelial tissue, a vascular, regenerates, that sort of thing. Um, admittedly, this is a, a bit, this should be a bit fresh in your memory. Um, if not, go back and review that histology thing. You're gonna need to, to define terms like atrophy and, and necrosis. So make sure that you're aware of those things um, and that you can use those terms appropriately. What I'd like to stress to you here is that, well, you do need to study for this test. Time is not infinite. You're not going to be able to look up every single answer, but you are welcome to use your notes. Ask questions. If you don't understand that question, you'll have time to send me a text, ask the question. I can clarify. There's something that, there's a question there and it's a concept that you just don't understand or you, you miss somewhere, just to ask. But you're welcome to use your notes. The reason for that is if we were in a clinical situation and there was something you didn't understand, you wouldn't look it up. You wouldn't guess at it. You are not welcome to ask each other. You should not work together on these exams. If I hear of you working together for the exams, then we'll explore the use of the Proctorio software. I don't like that idea and I've never used it, but if it comes to light that this has been a group project, we'll go that way. In the meantime, we're not doing that because I hate it. It just seems invasive, right? The questions are at a difficulty level where you're going to be expected to synthesize information that you need to put together the puzzle pieces now. It's not just recollection. It's putting the puzzle together. So keep that in mind as you study. But again, they all are multiple choice questions. When you're completed with the lecture exam, you should do the lab exam, although you don't have to do them in that order. And like I said, the lab exam is just 50 identification things. Basically it's multiple choice just matching, um, but you should be fine there. I'm not super worried about that. I don't expect you to, to struggle with the skull anatomy 
So I, I expect you to be fine there. All in all, look for this exam next week. Don't stress out about it. Just be diligent and do what you need to do. And we'll get through this. With that, I'm going to let you go. If you have any questions about the review or about material, just send me a text. I'm much better about answering the texts than emails. I get a lot of texts, but I'm usually, unless I just happen to miss it, I'll answer your text. Don't text you in the middle of the night. I will hunt you down. In the meantime, my wife is encouraging me to make TikTok videos for anatomy. I don't have any idea why anyone would want to watch anatomy TikToks. To be honest, I don't know why anybody wants to watch TikToks, but that's, I'm not that old. I just don't have that much of an attention span. Yeah, I know it's like a minute. Still. You think I'm stalling? I'm stalling because I'm thinking about uh, any material that I've skipped over that I, I really need you to know. Um, cell membrane. I think we're okay. Well, I, I can't promise you that we've been over everything that's there. Um, general idea. Let's, though, before we go, let's try uh, an example here of uh, what I'm talking about. When I talk about this sort of uh, critical thinking, sort of putting this uh, information together. There is a condition called inclusion cell disease eye cell disease. It results from a defective enzyme in the Golgi apparatus. The, the enzyme um, transfers a phosphate to a uh, carbohydrate and specific proteins, um, and, and it, it targets them to uh, the lysosomes in the cells. So this enzyme targets proteins to the lysosome. Now, in eye cell disease, you don't get this. You get a defective enzyme. And because it's defective, that protein, those proteins, I should say, are secreted out of the cell. Without this protein, the lysosome can't do its job. And so What's going to happen? Take a second and think about this. If the lysosome can't do its job, what happens? Well, what does the lysosome do? The lysosome is a digestive organelle. It's full of enzymes that break down things. 
carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, etc. And if the lysosome can't do its job, the cell can't break down those products. So instead, those products build up inside the cell. So you get a buildup of these substances. And when you look at it under a microscope, you see these inclusions, inclusions in the cell. And it will destroy cells. So you'll see this very early on, um, very small baby developmental delays, abnormal development, um, enlargement of organs like the liver and the spleen. Um, and eventually uh, clouding of the cornea because those proteins build up in the cornea, um, difficulty in, in cognitive skills. And usually, um, usually this ends up being fatal in the first decade. There's no treatment. Uh, I should say there's no cure. So questions that can be asked here. If I tell you that you have proteins that are being shipped to the wrong place in the cell, what organelle is affected by this? What organelle is doing this? Well, you should know that that's the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus here is shipping in the cell. So if something's being shipped to the wrong place in the cell, that's the defective organelle. If I tell you that it leaves you with non-functional lysosomes, you should understand that lysosomes are digestive organelles. And if they're not digesting things inside the cells, stuff is going to build up inside the cells. So if I tell you the symptoms are some sort of uh, protein or fatty acid building up inside the cell, what organelle has been damaged because the Golgi apparatus can't do its stupid job, you should know that it's going to be the lysosome. I hope that made as much sense to, to you as it did in my head. But these are the sorts of things that I'm expecting you to synthesize this information together. Um, word of advice, do not confuse the four primary tissue classes with the four types of connective tissue. That happens a lot, so try not to do that. And I think you'll be okay. Any questions and specifics, just like I said, drop me a text and we'll move on from here. So look for this exam next week. If you have any questions in the meantime, just let me know. If you need to uh, get in touch with me, you can text me. If you need to set up a meeting, um, let me know and we'll set up a Zoom meeting. Have a good night.